To start off, we're not going to look at Laravel's own code, but in order to understand the very fundamentals of how Blade works, we first need to take a step back and look at some of the core features of PHP. We're going to take a look at a few different things here, but it'll all come together at the end when we write our own version of the view function, so strap in. If you weren't aware, PHP actually started as a templating language itself before it evolved into the fully fledged programming language that we know today. While it's not the same as the first version of PHP, there's a little bit of syntax left over from when that was its main purpose, which you might not be aware of if you've only ever used PHP for programming logic. And that's the alternative syntax for control structures. We can see with this syntax, it just replaces the opening brace of a statement with a colon, and the ending brace with the word end followed by the statement name. For example, we can take this totally normal looking PHP file and change the opening braces to colons and the ending brace to the word end if. And if we run it, it'll work exactly the same. It might look a little bit verbose here, but it makes a lot more sense in an HTML template when you open and close tags a lot. Let me just paste this in. Here you can see we've got a lot of floating braces at the end, and in an HTML file that might have hundreds of lines of code in between and lots of indentation because HTML forces you to indent stuff a bit, that can be kind of hard to read. So by replacing it with a version that uses the alternative structure, we can see what the ending for each statement actually corresponds to. Now that's out of the way, we'll come back to use that later, but let's move on to output buffering. The output buffer is just a place that PHP internally keeps track of what it needs to send to the browser, but before it actually sends it. That means anything that gets echoed or printed, any var dump statements, and anything outside of PHP tags. If that doesn't make sense, let's look at an example. We've got a plain index.php file here, and remember we've not got any frameworks or composer for this. We're just going to echo foo and bar. If we run this with the PHP internal server, and then browse to it, we'll see foobar echo to the page just as we might expect. Foo and bar are now in the output buffer of this script, and they'll be sent to the browser. But PHP itself comes with a handful of handy functions that we can use to interact with this buffer before the response is sent to the browser. So we can verify that they're actually in the output buffer by looking through these functions and using obgetContents, which returns the contents of the output buffer and just dumping that. If we refresh the page, we'll see that we are dumping a string that's six characters long containing the text foobar, just as we might expect. There's a similar function to that called obgetClean, which also returns the contents, but in the process it clears the buffer of anything that was in it before, which is super handy if we wanted to manipulate anything that made it in there before we send it to the browser. For a simple example, we could uppercase everything then echo it back into the buffer. Now, there's another interesting thing about output buffers in PHP, and that's that there can be multiple levels of buffers active at a time. We can use the obgetLevel function to see what the current level is. Note that when we hit this in a browser, it gives us an integer of 1, so we're currently in the first level of output buffering. The web server has actually automatically opened an output buffer for us. However, if we go back and run it in the console, it returns an integer of 0, which means there's no output buffer already opened. And this behavior can be a bit different depending on your server or your PHP any settings, and frameworks usually do a bit to normalize that themselves. We can manually start a new output buffer level by using the ob start function. Now when we run this in the terminal, we'll see that it returns an integer of 1. And if we go back to the browser, it returns an integer of 2 because it's taking into account the output buffer that the web server automatically started for us.
but we can use this along with some of the functions PHP provides to end the current level of buffer. Either obendflush will end the current buffer and send the contents to the browser, or obendclean will just discard the contents of the current buffer and end it. To show what I mean, let's echo 1, 2, and 3, but around the second echo we can start a new buffer and then end it right after. Now when we run this file, whatever happened between the start and end of that buffer will be discarded, no matter what it is, and it will never be displayed. We've got complete control over the output buffer of all the code that happens inside that block. But before we discard the buffer, we can still save the contents of it to a variable to use later on. Let's just dump it at the end to show that. Now we can see we've removed two from the output buffer, but we've done something with it after the fact. So yeah, that's output buffers, and that's all we're going to cover here, but there's more functions and variations of the existing functions to work with. If you're interested in learning more about the output buffers, I recommend checking out the PHP docs, they cover them quite well. Now the final thing we're going to look at is the require statement, which is possibly one of the most fundamental pieces of PHP. It basically executes a whole other PHP file in its entirety, as if it were in line right here. Let's echo 1, 2, and 3 again. But we're going to put 2 in a separate file. Now when we execute it, we can see it evaluates each of the echo statements in order, just as we would expect it to. And this is a good time to remember what I said about output buffers earlier. Anything not in a PHP tag is automatically in the output buffer. That means we can actually put plain text in the required file. Or HTML. or mix in PHP tags inside that. They'll all go to the output buffer as if it were just one big string that we were echoing. Another useful thing to know about required files is they actually inherit any variables that were in scope when it was required. We can define a variable before the require statement, then make use of it inside the included file. And that's basically all we need to know about output buffers. So here we've got down all the basics and we understand how these core PHP functions work. Let's put them all together and make our very own view function that does just what Laravel's one would do, except as we'll use plain PHP templates. First, let's clean up our workspace. We're going to start by defining a function. That'll accept a view name and an array of data that we can pass to the view file. And it'll return a string of the executed view code. Then we can take the view name and find the file path from that. In fact, we can also do what Laravel does by using dots as a delimiter for any files and subdirectories just by replacing it with a slash. And then we want to make sure that the view file actually exists. Now we can safely assume the file exists at this point, so we can just require it to execute it. But remember, we want to return a string, so we should capture the output buffer of that. And then we can return the resulting string that was in the buffer. Let's try this out quickly. In the same file, we're just going to echo the view contents and pass in some data. And now we can make the welcome view file. 
For now, we're just going to dump the currently defined variables to see what's in scope. Now we can see we have variables in the view, but they aren't exactly what we wanted. We have the data we passed in, but it's in an array called data, so they're not accessible as regular variables as we want. We also have the extra view name and path variables because they were defined in our function, but we probably don't want those to be accessible in our view. That could get very confusing if we passed in our own data properties with either of those names. So let's solve that. Firstly, let's lock the require statement in a closure, but have that closure execute immediately so the file is still required. That's because closures have their own scope in PHP, which means that the required file isn't going to have access to any of the other variables in our main view function. But this does mean that it won't have access to the path variable that it needs either. So let's explicitly pass that in as an argument when we invoke the function and accept it as an argument in the closure. We're going to change the name of the argument a little bit and prefix it with two underscores, just as a convention to note that it's an internal variable name. Now when we rerun the code, we can see we've just got the one variable in scope, the file path, which we needed in scope because we're using it with the require statement itself. But we still need the data, so let's pass that in as an argument too. And now we can use the extract function that comes from PHP's core, which takes a key value array like we've given it, and it adds them all as variables to the current scope, where the key is the variable name and the value is, well, the value of the variable. And then we can also unset the argument we passed in, since we don't need it because all the other variables are in scope in this closure now. And when we run this code, we can see it works exactly as intended now. The keys we passed into the data arguments array are now available inside the view as real variables. Now we can use this along with all of PHP's regular templating syntax to build out a template. I'm just going to paste one in here. We can use full control structures, echo variables, and run PHP functions inline exactly as we would want. And this is already starting to look a little bit like Blade. But realistically, you'd probably refactor our view function a little bit to clean it up, so I'm going to do that quickly. So here's a refactored code. Now we can see the function itself actually just creates an instance of a new view class and then calls the render method on it. This class does pretty much exactly the same as our function before, but it's just split up a little bit. Notably, now we don't need that automatically invoked closure, which is kind of a hack, just to capture the variable scope, because that logic is now in its own method and there aren't any variables in scope by default. Instead, we access the data and path as properties that are set on the object. If we run it, it'll work exactly the same as before. And there we have it. We've explored some of the fundamentals of PHP that you probably don't touch much if you're using a framework like Laravel. But this is what underpins the entirety of how Blade itself works. Blade just evaluates a plain PHP file and captures its output buffer for you to use. But Blade obviously does more than just that. So next up, we'll take a look at how Blade turns its own custom syntax into plain PHP files for it to evaluate.